Polygamy or eternal damnation? What a choice. Next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith. All of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free. But I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I am your host, Doris Hansen, and tonight's show, we are interviewing a woman who lived plural marriage as a member of, of the Apostolic United Brethren Polygamy Group. But before we talk about what isn't God's will for marriage, you can find out what God's will for marriage is at a special weekend to remember Marriage Getaway, which is taking place this weekend at the Park City Marriott Hotel. It uh, begins tomorrow night and it goes uh, through the 4th. That will be November 2nd through the 4th. And this is for married couples or soon to be married couples. And there may still be time for you to register even though it starts tomorrow. Um, you can go online to www.familylife.com slash weekend. And if you use the group name God's Plan, you may be able to go for half price. You can call Ross or Teresa Callahan for more information, and their number is 801-253-2952. And this getaway will help you and your spouse discover God's plan for your marriage, and you can refresh your marriage God's way. You know, we named our show Polygamy, What Love Is This? for the specific reason that we always want our viewers, especially plural wives, to know that God's love is so great, it's so high and so long and so wide and so deep, it would be impossible for him to demand and command the painful life of polygamy that polygamists claim he expects of them. What kind of a love forces a woman to share her husband with other women? What kind of love is this? It isn't God's love, that's for certain. In fact, it really is no love at all. Tonight, our guest is Kristen Decker, and she has written a book about her life in polygamy. She was born and raised in a polygamy group, and she lived a polygamous marriage. And the book is entitled, 50 Years in Polygamy, Big Secrets and Little White Lies. And she has a wonderful story to tell. We're going to talk about that tonight. So I would like to introduce and welcome our guest, Kristen Decker. Thank you, Kristen, for coming. Thank you, Doris. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. We've planned on this for quite a while. and A long time. And, <laughs> and it's good you finally came. You know, your book has such great insights into the polygamous lifestyle and into the beliefs and the doctrines and the practices and the pain of polygamy and that polygamists suffer through. Mm -hmm. uh, and so where would you tell our viewers they could get your book? It's available at Balboa Publishing or Balboa Press at Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com or any pretty much any bookstore, I think, will order it if, it, if they don't already have it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So they can go to Amazon. I think that's where I got 
my copy was uh, Amazon. Amazon.com Amazon. has it available. You can, if you have Kindles, you can do that as well. Oh, it's on so, Kindle. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. It's so a... it's, it's 50 years in polygamy, um, big secrets and little white lies. We're going to talk about some of those big secrets and little white lies tonight right. as, as we go through your book. And that's just kind of what we want to do. Wasn't there a website um, that you wanted to tell our viewers that they Thank could go to? Thank you for reminding me about that. It's 50 years in polygamy.com. Really easy. Or dot org uh -huh. either way either so it's one. easy to remember okay, the name of the book altogether.org or .com and so they can go there uh -huh. and find out a little bit about you and right about the some of the and things and I've posted yeah. over uh -huh. the yeah good and yeah, be interesting you know I like to read sometimes uh, what what people think of of a book before I'll read a book and so I looked at some of the reviews of your book before I read it and I think probably a very interesting uh, and mostly positive responses to your book but one of them was written by a woman who had not read your book yet and I thought <laughs> I would quote what she said uh, she was a potential reader looking forward to reading your book and she said I'd sure like to hear a real story after the fractured fairy tale that Sister Wives tries to put out there. So she was looking forward to getting, you know, to the grit right. of what really is happening in polygamy groups. And indeed, your story definitely is far removed from the fantasy kind of life of plural marriage that yeah. the Sister Wives portray. And you're from the same group. You're both right. from the All Red yes. Polygamy group. Yes, we are. Do you know them? So, are you, are you actually, Christine, who's Cody's third wife, is my second cousin and my niece through is that marriage. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I know all of them, uh -huh. and knew their families and know them very their families pretty well mm -hmm. over these years. And you know, some yeah, families so. in polygamy groups can be as different as night and day. Yes. That's the way for it was sure. in, in the Kingston group because mm -hmm. some families are just so different than other very families. Very much. Yes. Well, um, I already identified that with the polygamy group that you came from. So geographically, where were you raised? I was raised in Murray, where the Fashion Place Mall is. And it, we used to call it Polygyville, and all those around us called it Polygyville. There were, <laughs> when I was really little, it was a dead-end street and ended. And then it grew over the years as the properties spread out and more homes were built, more polygamous families moved in. Yeah. And so Polygyville, huh? Yes. <laughs> so they should have named the mall Polygamall. <laughs> So who was <laughs> well, some attention this, there? Yeah, right? it's the same property. Anyway, so who was your prophet, and what relationship did the prophet have with your family? When I was born, Joseph Musser apparently I think was still alive. Yes, he was. And then when he died, my uncle Roland took his place. And then my when he died, when he was shot by the LeBarons, then. Erbil LeBaron had two of his wives assigned to kill my uncle mm, Rulin, mm -hmm. murder him in his office, and then my father became the leader after that. Your and father he was, became the leader? He was the leader for 25 years before he so died. So Rulin mm -hmm. Allred was the leader when you were born. Right, and, when I was young. And, mm -hmm. and he, or when you were younger, and, right. and your father is... Owen he, all. Right, Owen Allred. He passed away in 2005, but he was the leader for 25 years uh -huh. until then. So, so you were the daughter of the leader. Right. And, and that kind mm -hmm. of put a stigma on you, didn't it? It was like, you better behave or Yeah, else. you better. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> Be a good that. example. Yeah. <laughs> were your parents born in the polygamy group or did they join it? My father, I can't come from seven generations of plural marriage on my father's side. In fact, my sixth grandfather, great grandfather, baptized my seventh grandfather in Illinois wow. in wow. the Mormon church, in the LDS church. And so they each of them lived plural marriage for all these years. All and so it was definitely, yes, seven generations of belief system in plural marriage. Wow. And my mother was a convert in a sense. Well, she was part of the LDS Church. It is true that my father and her father converted her to believe in plural marriage after the manifesto. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. A lot of that. In fact, that's our heritage. Right. Definitely our heritage. Where in the sequence of your father's um, family, wives and children, do you fit in? I mean, were you you're the, were the first wife or the first child or the... 12th child or my mother was his first wife she had eight children and I'm her baby but I'm my father's 12th child so out of his 23 biological children 
And then he helped raise another 23 with the women that he married after that, that came with mm. children that mm. married him. I see. So mm -hmm. total siblings? About 46 as 46 we were growing up. And family. as my younger siblings were growing up, we had quite a few around. Oh, so, wow. That's yeah. a big fat. For polygamy, that's pretty normal. Though, Actually, in it? a way, it's small for some. <laughs> <laughs> and my for dad many. only had two wives and 16 <laughs> kids. Wow. So how good or not so good were the relationships, um, let's say, between between uh, that, that you are aware of between your father and all his wives and between the sister wives and between the children in the mix of all this how are the relationships that could be a long story right well, there in maybe itself you could say it in a word or two. <laughs> <laughs> i i believe my mother with all her heart believed in plural marriage or she wouldn't have done lived that way mm -hmm. and so she did her best to live it without the jealous feelings and without the heartache but she there was a lot I saw a lot and witnessed a lot and the second wife was pretty controlling and wanted her way and demanded her way and saw that her children got their needs met and what they wanted and needed which mothers should do mm -hmm. my mother was more passive about maybe passive aggressive mm -hmm. she didn't know how to deal with her heartache and pain and when she would try to do that, it didn't work for her. She didn't know how to talk about it, yeah. how to get her needs met, how to make sure that that happened. And so she just became the sweet martyr, you know, do whatever mm -hmm. Owen wants, be his favorite wife in the way that she'll give in to the other wives. And if they ever need it, this was my opinion and some of my other siblings is that if they ever needed anything, she was the one who went without. Um, she got a home later in her life and another woman wife wanted that plate upstairs wanted that one so she had to move down and then mm, she got to move here and then they wanted that place and mom was always the sweet martyr <laughs> mm -hmm. and tried to be but she was I would say she died pretty miserably happy yeah, if you, she was happy. happy doing what she thought yeah, God wanted her to do so how, were you, how did you deal with all your siblings? How did they deal with you? Or we loved each family? other. I, our, I believe our, the kids loved each other. We played well together for the most part, and we did our best to be brothers and sisters, even though we were called cousins, you know, yeah, right. to keep the secrets and mm -hmm. so forth. But I believe I really enjoyed my siblings, and I think that that's one thing that you do is you draw together. Even though you get lost in the crowd, you still draw together for whatever they can help you with or be friendly with. And besides that, we didn't have friends outside of the community either. Right. So right. that That's was another right. thing to stay close. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to, uh, and as we go through your book, I'm basically what I did was when I read your book, I just made notes of what I thought would be good talking points. Mm -hmm. and, and the next talking point I want to bring up is, is probably um, a real heartbreak for you, but you put it in your book, so I wanted to bring it up. Uh, you were sexually assaulted by a doctor and also by a stepbrother and by others while you were very young. Um, what did that do to you emotionally and especially with trust issues? I had major trust issues, mostly with God. And the reason was is because my mother had always told me that if I was a good girl, that bad things wouldn't happen to me. And I, could, I couldn't understand that. It was like, I must be a bad person mm -hmm. or God wouldn't allow this to happen because my mother told me that, that yeah. God wouldn't allow anything bad to happen to me. And so I did, had trust issues with God as well as myself. It was like, what kind of person am I if this is happening and I can't tell anybody mm -hmm. and I don't dare say I must be really bad. Yeah. And I felt guilty. And of course, the perpetrator's would yeah. allow that uh -huh. to happen, like you're well, part of it, and you and better would not make tell. You feel Absolutely, that way even more so. yes, even more. And, mm -hmm. you, and and the first time it, you were not even in kindergarten yet, right? That, that I was just very little. Yeah. How did the sexual abuse affect your relationships, especially with your husband later on in life? There were issues and problems that I had no idea that even connected until I was able to get some help and talk with. Actually, it wasn't professional help; it was just talking with family or a sister that I realized that those connections and with my husband, that the uh, issues that we had with our relationship had to do with being molested when I was little. Mm -hmm. Once I worked with that and realized that this was okay and that was okay and this is normal and that's normal and mm -hmm. this is not yeah. and what's all right, then I learned to get through that. But it was, it was a major problem. And I, and I think it was great that you yeah. wrote all this up in your book too, mm -hmm. because this is not a, a an out of normal event, especially in polygamy right. communities. So it's right. good that you put that in your book so others could read 
And what? I felt it was important to be explicit about it. There was a comment, a couple of them, that people had a hard time with that, to be that detailed and explicit about the being molested. But the p reason I did that is because I feel like people need to realize the impact mm -hmm. that it has mm -hmm. on so many. And I, he I heard most of my life, oh, well, I was molested. Oh, she was too. Yeah, I was too. And so, so and so. And, and it was like, oh, it's a big deal. No big deal. That happens. Mm. You know, and so to me, and it was very what, important. That's the tragedy of it, isn't it? It is. It, is it just yeah. happens so much that mm -hmm. it's just... It's important for people to realize that this isn't okay and that yeah. there is repercussions and things yeah. that happen. It's, it yeah, isn't okay. It's damaging. It isn't okay, mm -hmm. period. Very. Now, you went to public school, and uh, in, in your book you mentioned when some of the students found out that you were polygamous, and they called you pigamuses. They Probably because <laughs> they couldn't understand what polygamy was and even how to pronounce it. That was in kindergarten. <laughs> I was sharing a story about a little person who was playing with me, and she said, uh, how many, I asked her, how many moms do you have? And she said, well, I have one. And I said, well, I have three, you know? And she's like, well, how come you get to have three? And I have one. So she asked her mom about it. And of course, her mom's saying, you can't play with her anymore. She's a polygamist. And <laughs> And so the little person in kindergarten here is pigamous. Yeah. So she comes and tells me, no, I can't play with you. You're a pigamous. And I said, I'm not a pigamous. And, and your dad's a pigamous. And I said, he's not messy. He keeps his room really clean. So I didn't even get you it. Even I was understand. so young. I, even did I didn't friend. get it. I'm sure she she didn't had no idea either. what it was. Yeah. It was, that was uh, kind of a cute story. And you talked about drills that your father would put the family through in, in their family home evening night. Mm -hmm. uh, Polygamous also had family home evening night, you know, right. so did we. Anyway, he, you, he put you through those drills to protect your polygamous lifestyle. Would you, uh, could you, do you believe you could call these drills uh, lessons in learning to lie? Oh, And did absolutely. they induce a group think mentality, do you think? And did they affect your emotional security? Well, the, it was okay to lie as long as it was to protect our family and to protect God's will and Polygamy was God's will, and therefore that was justified. And yeah, and we did get the lessons that lying wasn't okay in other issues. Yeah, but the yeah. problem became in Same trying to figure here. out mm -hmm. what lies were okay and which ones weren't. And it was so it got to be so good. We got to be so good at who's that mom over there and what's that going on over there that pretty mm -hmm. soon you'd get the lies mixed <clears> up. And I'd go, oh, I told one that I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> And then weighing that out between God's laws and His rules. Okay, which lies are really okay and which yeah, ones aren't? Yeah, it's kind of yes, confusing for it a was, child, isn't it? It is. Double standard. It was. It felt, it, it hurt. It, it really it did. It was wrong it to felt. lie. God says, don't lie. And then God tells you to lie to protect. Well, the difficult part was remembering which lies you know, already <laughs> told who. He was like, okay, yeah. did I tell him that the third wife was aunt so-and-so or the other aunt or who was, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. It was yeah. confusing to yeah. even me as a child. And it yeah. was to me too. We did the same yeah. thing. We yes. had drills of how we would answer certain people if they asked certain questions. Mm -hmm. And so from, from childhood, we were taught <clears throat> that we had to keep a, a silent tongue regarding our family life. Right. So we couldn't tell. I mean, this is in itself is abnormal. You can't go to school and tell anybody about your family life. Right. They could tell us about theirs, but we could never speak about Absolutely. ours. So it's, <laughs> exactly. it's, it's a sad thing for kids. Uh, when you were 10 years old, you were assaulted again. And this time it was by the husband of a friend of your mother. And you said in your book he that... He was that actually a cousin. He was a cousin. Uh -huh. and, and he by it, marriage. It, mm -hmm. firm, it further traumatized you. You said that this event actually is the one that began turning you into a rebellious child. What? Uh, why did this event do that? I think I was old enough to finally realize that I could say no or that I was going to say no, no matter who wanted me to say no. And my mom wanted me to still continue to babysit, and my mom wanted me to continue to be this sweet girl and go and tend these kids that where the father was molesting, well, I believed after that effect, molesting his own children. I don't know that, but he was with me, and it, and it was a big concern. And I said, I'm not going anymore. And that's what I mean by the rebellion. It was like I put my foot down. I said, no, I you will not no. go. And, it, and even then, I couldn't tell my mother why. Yeah. It was one of those fear-based things that you mm -hmm. respect the elders. He'll be believed before I yeah. will. They won't believe me. I'll be in trouble. And so, so I couldn't tell her why. So were you able to tell anyone? It took you years before you could tell anyone I was about an the abuse mm -hmm. that these men had perpetrated on you while you were growing up. 
I had most of my children before I ever told anybody that as far as other than my husband about it or maybe close sisters when we realized that this was going on all around us in many yeah, situations. Yeah. And yes, I, it, I was an adult before I confronted well or talked to my father and the, my cousin so about and, that. And you know, home mm -hmm. is where we're supposed to feel secure, be secure, be safe. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the very place where in many polygamy groups, home is not your, your place of security. I think that the biggest problem, I've thought about that a lot, is the families are so large. The mothers are gone. And even, even if there's a mother home watching the children, she has sometimes a dozen children to keep track mm -hmm. of. How does she know where they're all at all the time, she every can't. minute, and give them one-on-one -on -one attention that they need? She I really can't. think small families you know, yeah. definitely advocate for that. Yes, so. for sure. In mm -hmm. Chapter 7, you wrote, I fantasized about a normal life, a dad, one mom, and one family, and wished God could uh, never hear me think wicked things like that. That touched me very much when I read that because that's kind of the way I had my little fantasy dreams as well. How old were you when, when you uh, were writing about this, and how really wicked was that dream? Oh, that was bad. We're supposed to be God's elite. His little handful of people are going to be saved. And all around me, I thought everyone was as proud to be a polygamist, and I wasn't. Mm. And it, I always felt like something was wrong with me. As an adult, I thought, how many others have felt the same way and I'm didn't sure. dare say that? In fact, I think in yes. a nutshell, that statement yeah. that you wrote there, in a nutshell, explains some of the emotionally mixed up messes Doesn't that it? we're in when we walk away from the polygamy mm -hmm. group. We just wanted to be normal. Right. We just wanted to have a father, someone I could call daddy. Someone who well, was there every yeah. day and a mom who could be there and not have her heartaches because yeah. dad was somewhere with the other women or mm -hmm. off or in an argument and left her crying. And yeah. Someone else yeah. needs me more than you do. Yeah. At 17 and a half years old, you married your sweetheart and you were his first wife. Now that right. was a blessing. And like all young marriages, you thought that you would live happily ever after. Did you fear the day when he was going to take oh, the yeah. second wife? <laughs> Definitely. How long before he did? It was eight years before he married, and we were going to hell because we weren't on it. You know, all around us, my brothers and sisters and our age group had been enlarging their families and having other wives. and. My siblings had already been in plural families, and I'm thinking, oh, no, oh, no, we're not going to make it, we're not going to make it. And I would push and encourage him to get other wives, and he's encouraging me to be supportive of his flirting with other women so oh. he can get other wives. And, you know, we're trying to do that, and not really, really outwardly. I mean, not so obviously. Yeah. you got to do it subtly. But at the same time, my heart was breaking. Yeah. I knew that we were supposed to do this. We have to do this to get mm -hmm. to heaven. Mm -hmm. But my heart would break. It would just... I'd cry and I think, how could he flirt with her? Well, he has to. You're the bad person. Yeah, You're the evil person yeah. for having those feelings. And yeah, my feelings were not okay and because yeah. that meant I wasn't being a good, righteous. And the righteous. fact that your husband, I mean, mm -hmm. think, to think of this as so, so messed up that your husband can legally, with an open door, go out and flirt with single women, single girls, mm -hmm. flirt with them and dance with them and take them on dates and then eventually marry them. I mean, that's a heartbreak yeah. for a lot of woman. the AB. We didn't really date much as far as single women until they were committed, like in, uh, say, a engagement or something like that. Mm -hmm. But just that they'd come over, or that we would go to their houses, or that we'd be at church or wherever that flirting was taking place, yeah. or at the dances. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that was an opportunity to dance with young girls. But I have a picture of one of my cousins and him, and they just both look like they're in heaven. She, at the time, I believe she was crazy about him and vice versa. And I looked at that picture very recently and I thought, oh my gosh, I remember when my heart, I loved her mm -hmm. and I loved him. And I thought, oh, that's good. Got to be good because this is meant to be the religion says so. But my heart was breaking. Yes. It was just sad. Yes, yeah. yes. And it does ask. Well, mm -hmm. this next statement, I want to put this up on the screen. It's on page 61. Uh, that you wrote, and I quote, According to my upbringing, God commanded women to accept their husband's desire to live the law of plural marriage. 
We were to be happy, supportive, sweet, and encouraging when it came to our husband's courting and marrying other wives. Still, even the idea of my husband being with another woman, let alone the reality of such a thing, created a throbbing, breath-stealing ache I could hardly endure. No religious doctrine could take that away. It was unfathomable that God would require that kind of a sacrifice of women." End quote. And this just touches the heartache that you went through, and many women do, of course, in polygamy. You tried to be a good and obedient plural wife and sister wife, despite the odds and the inequities. Would you explain, if you can, some of that and some of your questioning how it could be right, how a God actually could demand this kind of thing. I always questioned that, and I asked my father that a lot. I said, why is this okay? Why would he do this to hurt women? And, well, there was always a reason, Doris. There was a, min a million reasons, and we even sat around and made up reasons that weren't already there so we could endure the hurt or the jealousy or the pain and all the reasons that we could possibly come up with why plural marriage was good, which is what I hear yeah. people do. Yeah. And sister wives on <coughs> TLC mm -hmm. yeah. do that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons and they come up with even more. But the heartache, now it doesn't stop. You, The only way I got through it was to become a non-workaholic woman. I just do, I would go crazy cleaning. I could get things done really <laughs> good if I was heartbroken or jealous or oh, mad. I mean, yeah, it was just yeah. things really got done well, and that looked good. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like I'm sweet, I'm keeping sweet. The house is even clean, and all the kids are, <laughs> you know, bathed. And you know, so I never you just could. Do, I, yeah. I, and I, I got out before I was married, so I didn't live the polygamy life. I saw others live it. Um, my mother, of course, I knew she had a miserable life. But I never could come to the terms of, to term with the idea that polygamy was right and that it was holy. They said it was a holy thing. I never saw mm. any of that. I never saw I didn't any either. of the holiness that polygamy mm -hmm. was supposed to be. I didn't either. And fair. yet I bought into it and I was such a ple people pleasing person that I really bought into that and what I was told to do. Yeah. I always questioned, but I still kept doing it. Hey, yeah. Hanging on by faith, yeah. that was one yeah. of the things. Yeah, the, yeah. That, that blind faith. Uh, you know, I've spoken with a lot of people from different polygamy groups and several, several people from your group, the Allred group. And one woman in particular became extremely incensed with me because I remarked that all polygamy groups are abusive. She denied that there was any abuse going on in the Allred group, and she just said a plane didn't happen. And yet you've written about it in your book, a lot right. of abuse not only to yourself but to others, and I've talked with many people where abuse took place. Did the AUB threaten or brainwash people not to recognize abusive behavior, or could she have been self-deceived that she would so deny this? I think that a lot of people don't know what abuse is, for one thing. And I personally believe that polygamy in itself is abusive. So right off the bat when she'd say polygamy, you know, does, this doesn't happen. I don't think that the AUB, in a general, I wouldn't condone abuse. Someone else wouldn't condone abuse. But if you don't know what it is and you're not taught what, how to protect yourself and what's okay and what's not okay, and to what limit the man of the house or the priesthood leader has authority to demand his rights, or I heard of rapes. I, many girls, shouldn't say many, that's not true, several girls told me that they felt raped by mm -hmm. their husbands mm -hmm. when he wanted what he wanted. They, I think it's mostly not knowing what's going on and what is abuse and what's and not. What's it's a lack of, what and what is it, yes. No, yes, exactly. that's a lot of it. So mm -hmm. when your husband decided to take another wife, you'd been married eight years, how many children did you have? And did you suffer guilt when you suffered your jealousy? Oh my word, yes, definitely. I had three children by then, and my son was very close to her daughter's age. She came in with one little girl, mm -hmm. and uh, I definitely was heartbroken. And of course, I beat myself up for that. It was my fault if I was a better woman, if I was a better wife, if I was a better mother. If I was more faithful and more righteous, I wouldn't have these bad feelings, and I better get over it. In fact, recently, this is this is descriptive of what Christine went through when Cody, TLC, 
took his third, fourth wife on their honeymoon, Robin, mm -hmm. and she said, I better, I need to just get over my petty jealousy. And I wanted to find her and hug her and say, you poor girl, mm -hmm. you know, he's it's off right. with some other woman and you're calling it petty it jealousy. It is petty jealousy at It all. is not okay at no, all. No, and we, But we believed we were supposed to deal with that yeah. and that we were the bad people, just like she said, in order to, that we have any normal feelings that God gave us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God-given God feelings to say something's wrong right. here. This right. isn't okay. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. God yeah. did give us those feelings of jealousy. Mm -hmm. It is wrong to share our spouse. Right. And it never came yeah. from Him. And those mm -hmm. jealousies are self-protective. And, and protective of your, yeah. of your marriage, too. You entitled Chapter 21, Poverty and Dumpster Diving. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting because I thought only the Kingston Group did dumpster diving. So I was quite surprised oh, when I no. read, uh, There's read your many, story. There's many, many people that. in the Allred Group so, who dumpster dive. So what was <laughs> your, did. You, your father was the, the prophet. Which, how was your domestic economics and how did they deal with tithing? in your group. Did well, they? you were supposed to pay tithing. I don't know that we ever did because we never had any money to pay the tithing, but then that in itself was a, what do you want, dichotomy because if we paid our tithing, then we would have been better off, but then we never never had those. So that was always a trial. But it was kind of feast and famine. My husband was in construction, and it was. It was like feast and famine, and there would be lots and lots of times without jobs or long periods of time without any money or wondering where the money is coming from to pay any bills or to get food. And mm -hmm. that, and so we did. We, mm -hmm. I would throw my little kids over, help them get in the dumpster. Whoa, what's that down there? And some of our finds are really cool. <laughs> uh, most of them were just disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure of that. Um, we, um, uh, on page 112, I want to put this up on the screen as well, and uh, you wrote in your book, and, and this is a heartbreaker as well, you said, uh, quote, just hold on to the iron rod, the straight and the narrow path to God. It's better to stick with your testimony and be wrong than to leave and find out you were wrong. Why? I wondered why a loving God wouldn't want and expect us to find the truth or know if our testimony was wrong, even if we made mistakes on the road to discovery. My problem was that I had a strong testimony of plural marriage. I certainly would not have committed myself to such insanity if I hadn't. But did I believe because a loving and gracious God granted me witnesses to that fact? If not, did my testimony derive from the God of ever-present threats, eternal damnation, and hell with no family ties? Was that God of my upbringing the culprit of my religious certainty? Was my confirmation of the rightness of polygamy based on a fear of the punishments I'd heard a billion times since my birth? I didn't know. After all was said and done, it was just plain easier to stay in my blinded bliss where the doctrines I was raised to believe in could stay safe and snug in my head. If I didn't have the answers, I could simply fly by the seat of my pants <laughs> on faith. Yeah. And you, you basically, you know, talked yeah. about that a little bit already. These pros, exact words and conclusions, I am sure, are shared by thousands of oh, women yes. who have left yes. and have escaped polygamy. But when you questioned the validity of polygamy, how tempted were you to study for yourself and find out truly if God did, or did you just... Did, did, did you come to that point? I think that by then I was pretty addicted to where I was at too. You know how you can become addictive to abusive situations and you don't even know it? You don't know it's addi an addiction. You don't know uh, it's abusive. abusive. You don't, I'm just going to stay. I have all these kids. How could I leave? What would I do differently? I have no clue. It's just easier, like yeah. I said, to stay yeah. here. Even though it stay in the misery because I knew nothing else. And right. I was even studying. I was afraid to find out almost because yeah. then I might have to do something differently. It's weird because you'd think that being that way, you'd want to jump out, you'd do anything. Mm -hmm. And there were times that I felt that strength that I could, but I had, at that time I had no self-esteem enough to do it, to make it happen. And, and, and that was a bottom line. Fear, it, it was fear-based and I didn't love myself or even have a clue who I was to do anything mm -hmm. about it differently. And you know, so. often on this show, I'll mention the fact that the Bible says that God is love and perfect love drives out fear. Mm -hmm. And God, so this proves it's not from God because the fear that, that, that they face 
to look into the truth isn't from God. It can't be mm -hmm. because God is love. He's not fear. Perfect. Absolutely. Not fear. Well, we love. need to break here and, and invite our viewers to call in and ask your questions. Uh, so we have been talking with Kristen Dechter on, uh, regarding her book, 50 Years in Polygamy, um, uh, Big Secrets and Little White Lies. And so we're opening our phone lines now. If you want to call in, 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Give us a call and ask Christian some questions. Please stay on topic. And uh, we're, we are taking our break right now while we wait for the phone calls to come in. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. You are welcome to join us in our monthly support group, Life After Polygamy, where you can meet others like yourself who are searching for answers about polygamy and Mormon fundamentalism. We meet monthly in the Salt Lake City area. For more details about time and place, call us toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we've made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Welcome back to our show, Polygamy, What Love Is This? We've been interviewing Kristen Decker. She's the author of the book, uh, 50 Years in Polygamy, Big Secrets and Little White Lies. We've been talking about her story uh, being born and raised in the All Red or the AUB polygamy group and her life uh, being born in a polygamy family, being the daughter of the prophet and also being married in a polygamous marriage. Um, and we have opened up the telephone lines if you want to call in and talk with Kristen about anything or just make a comment or ask her a question, where you're welcome to do so. The number is 801-973-8820. Uh, you can begin calling in now. In fact, we have a call waiting for us right now, so let's take that on line one is Becky calling. Hello, Becky. Yeah. Yes, Becky, you're on I'm the air. I'm here. Yeah, you're on the air. Hi, Doris. How are you? Thank you so much for all you're doing. And, Christine, I don't know if you remember me. I remember you. I'm, I'm also from the AUB wow. group. I was just listening to how you talked about dumpster diving. <laughs> and for me... Um, I have such good memories of dumpster diving, going behind the store and uh, shopping for our food out of the little carts in the back instead of going in the store like normal people. Anyway, I just it, I just wanted to say hi, and um, I'm so glad that you found your way out. It's amazing. 
thank you, Becky. I wish I knew which Becky. I can think of two or three. So I'm so glad you called. Thank you. So Becky, Hello? Are, Becky, are you out of the of the group? Yes, yes. I, I left the polygamous group and then I joined the uh, Mormon church and I'm out of the Mormon church and I'm a biblical Christian. Oh, well, wonderful. Well, maybe we need to talk. Would you like to leave your phone number? I'd love to talk we, to you. We have talked, Doris. I was on your show on September 6th. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I'll find out. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> thanks, Becky. Uh -huh. Well, thanks Thank for you. calling. Thank you both. Yeah. This has been great watching you tonight. Have a great evening. It, it's good to hear from you, Becky. I didn't have your Thank last you. name here, so I wasn't didn't know who you were. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, she was. Uh, she she had a wonderful story. She, oh, she's got good. A good story. I need to find out who's which Becky because yeah. I can see think of several. Um, I, white. Oh my word. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She is darling. She is. She's a sweetheart. Oh, <laughs> Loved yay. having her on the show. Yes. Maybe we ought to get you both together. Yeah, we'll that would be John awesome. As a team here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have line three. John Murray. Hello, John. Yes. Yes, you're on the air, and you need to turn your TV volume down. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. What's your question? Yes, um, I have a quick question for you. I'm from Montana. Uh, the AUB group has a, has a group located up there in Pinesdale, uh -huh. and um, I am LDS, mainstream LDS. One of the things that interested me most as I grew up around and the people from Pinesdale was the unique sister wives mentality. Uh, and I'm interested to find out what your thoughts are regarding relationships with maybe some of your sister wives. Did you ever feel closer to them than you may have to your husband? Uh, some of the things that you all had to experience and go through. I felt closer to my sister wife when he was gone. And there was a long period of time when he was in California and she and I got really close. And I think that a lot of that depends because we're required to get to know our sister wives and to hang in there and be friends and get along. So I think that it made it easier for both of us when he was gone. I mean, we weren't concerned about where his attention and inspections yeah, yeah. were when, when he was around. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I had good experiences as well as negative, but my sister wife and I, I believe, were pretty good friends. Not hangout friends, but we got along because we needed to. We worked it out, even though there was lots of jealousy <laughs> on both parts. Yeah. yeah, but when you weren't fighting for the resources of your husband and his attention, then it was easier to establish a friendship relationship yes yes definitely mm -hmm. and we depended on each other again it's mm -hmm. kind of like the siblings thing yeah you know I'm fixing the car you're running here we're gonna grab this stuff and yeah. yes team there was more that yes team so that answer your question John it does thank you very much thanks for calling okay um, we, our phone lines are open if you want to call in 801-973 TV 20 give us a call and and uh, perhaps you'd like to be involved in this conversation. I want to quote another uh, quote from your book on page 134. Um, there was some physical and verbal abuse uh, taking place between your husband and the children. And it bothered you and you tremendously. And of course, being the weak passive women mm -hmm. that polygamists like to make us into be, you didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And there came a point of time where you knew you had to do something. And you said, and I think this will go up on the screen too, it said, you said, it was that day that I knew I would no longer make excuses or reasons for Mark's or anyone else's unkind or abusive behaviors toward our children or anyone else. There is no excuse. I had to do something different. The sad and scary part, doing something different, was a concept and task I knew nothing about. You right. needed to do something different. You, you, you knew you had to do it at that point in time. What did you do differently? And how did you learn not to be afraid of doing things differently after that? As I 
started learning to care about myself and love myself and realize that that was okay. And I did that with some therapy and some help by far. That made a big difference. But at that time when I really didn't know what to do, I pretty much told my children, I remember gathering them together and saying, if I ever yell at you, it's not okay. If your dad does, it's not okay. If we're screaming and yelling at you and calling you names, you leave. You have every right. And if I punish you or try to or your dad does for leaving, you say, mom gave us permission to go. This is not okay. If there's any abuse, you do not need to have it. You need to go. Go outside, rock, walk Go for a while, you know, take care mm -hmm. of yourself. That's the most important thing you could do. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started. And then later I started actually feeling like I had to stand it between my mm -hmm. husband and the children sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would move yeah. my body there. So, uh, Do you think that mm -hmm. your lifestyle produced more probably uh, frustrations toward to, to make people more abusive than they normally would be? Oh, yes, definitely. I know that... My husband's father was abusive. In fact, he it makes me sad. He And him, he would say, I don't want to be like my dad. And he would be gone and trying to provide for his huge family, just huge family that kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger and had no money for it. And so, of course, yeah. it caused the stress. And then he'd come home and punish the kids. And yeah. my husband didn't want to be that way either. But the stress is just, and the women are overwhelmed. They've yeah. had the kids all this time and trying to deal with no food and no clothing and what they need and the kids. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is very, it creates that, yes. It does. And, and mm -hmm. I remember my mother, she was physically abusive and, and verbally as well. Um, uh, and I look back at it now. I didn't understand it at the time. I look back at it now. And I know it was the lifestyle mm -hmm. that she took her frustrations out on us children. Yes. Definitely and I believe that's that. a lot of what my mother did is yeah. her... Her anger and her tears and her yeah, you know, tears. resentment and pulling mm -hmm. the hair came from that the, jealousy. The, the mm -hmm. pain that they yeah. suffer is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another call coming uh, from Yvonne in St. George. Hello, Yvonne. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. How are you tonight, Doris? Just fine, thank you. I just have a, a question for your guest. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering what kind of relationship does she have with God now in her life? I feel closer to God than I've ever felt in my whole life. I am, like Doris said, it says in the Bible, God is love and love is God. That's where I choose to stay, is completely in, in the realm of love and accept love and give love. That's the most important thing to me right now. My relationship with God, I believe, couldn't be any better. It's just, and it's between me and Him and not with somebody in the middle. And I love that. Well, the Bible's so. clear that only Jesus is our mediator yeah. between God and ourselves. Yeah. That there is no in-between. Yvonne, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Bye. You ladies have a wonderful evening, and God bless you. You too. Thank you, Yvonne. Bye. How did you deal... I know when I was in the group um, and on the abuses and the restrictions and the anger that was and the fear that I lived in daily, I blamed God for that because mm -hmm. this was supposed to be God's kingdom. This was supposed to be God's will, and yet it was nothing but misery. Did right. you go through that? I did. Same I wondered stage? why that I kept thinking, why is man made that they might have joy? And yet all around me, it felt like sorrow. That, not that we didn't have good times and laughter and fun mm -hmm. and not that our parents didn't, but there was so much sorrow yeah. and so much sadness and so much That's of the heartache. That's interesting that you say that because you know? that was a Joseph Smith saying. It wasn't mm -hmm. a Bible saying. Wow. And, wow. and Joseph Smith is also the one Man that came that up with the joyless joy. polygamy. So ah. <laughs> he, he was a phony I anyway. learn more every day. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it was that. It came from there. It yeah. came from Joseph yeah. Smith. It didn't yeah. come from God. That's mm -hmm. that's true. Okay, line three, Justin, Salt Lake City calling. Hello, Justin. Yes, hello. Yes, you're on the air, Justin. Hi, how are you ladies doing this evening? We're doing mm -hmm. good. Do you have a question? Yes, my question uh, for you, yes, I, I'd like to know, did your children ever come to you um, before you had left the polygamy lifestyle? Did your children ever give you any sort of, uh, you know, hints or signs that they, you know, did they ever encourage you to leave earlier than you did? My children all left before I did. 
and I'm so grateful for that. I called it rebellion and I was so devastated because I thought I was going to go to hell that my children were leaving and not doing what God wanted them to do and and I wasn't a better example and wasn't a better wife and so forth. So most of them, I have seven children, five of them left. When I left, when I divorced my husband, I took the last two with me in a sense that my daughter was 18 and my son was 14 and he went with me, but my oh. daughter was kind of on her own. So, yeah. yeah. And yes, they, they wanted me to think about things, <laughs> yeah. So. Definitely. Well, congratulations. I'm uh, very, very happy that you uh, decided to make the move and that you were able to do it successfully. And uh, I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay, we have another call. Uh, Jeff is calling in Salt Lake. Hello, Jeff. Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Oh, this isn't Jeff. <laughs> oh, well, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> This is this is Monica. I'm I'm up in Ogden. Okay. Well, I got the wrong information, but that's fine. We'd love to talk to you. What is your question? Okay. Um, my question is for either one of you. Um, when you decide when or a, when a woman decides to leave, like the Mormon Church or a polygamous family, are they allowed to take their children with them, or is there issues with that? You know, within the family. Do you want me to answer that? You can go ahead and answer for you. I think that that depends. I'm sure it depends on where you're at, which group you're in, who you're married to, what uh, demands or what beliefs you still have. The women, the way I grew up is the women were supposed to leave their children with the priesthood head, otherwise their father. In fact, I had a sister-in-law who went, left my brother and left the children with him because that was still her belief. She thought she was wicked and she left without them. But many women that want to leave will fight for their children when the husbands want them, and it's a battle like there might be in normal cases. Several women leave and leave the children thinking that that's what they should do. And many try to leave where the husbands have made threats. So there's all kinds of different situations. Mm -hmm. And that also goes within each group, too. It and does. depends on in more individual, I would say of the parents and the father and the and, priesthood. And depe yeah, it depends uh -huh. on where in the group, the, the uh, echelon of the father, right. the, uh, it does, whether yeah. or not uh, he's mm -hmm. part of the important family or not. It has right. a lot to do with it. I know in the FLDS communities that they've actually hidden children from their parents, who've, from women who've tried to leave with them, and they've taken them, and that a woman might not ever see them, and they've actually banned women who don't behave and keep the children and give them to other people. So... It's, it goes from one end of the spe to yeah. the other, mm -hmm. absolutely. Did mm -hmm. that answer your question? Yes, it does. I appreciate it greatly, and um, I just want to say that uh, God bless you both and for what you've done and for what you're doing, and may your life be blessed for giving all these women out there that need this information. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. calling. And you know, Thank that's you. why we do what we do. That's why you've written your book and why we do the show and why you're on the show is, is so that we can talk to people out there who have a misconception of polygamy, thinking that they're, it's a victimless crime or, or people maybe who want to leave and they're afraid to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, a lot of them have been told that if they leave, um, they'll regret it, that their life will, they'll be a sad and, and unhappy the rest of their life. And yet... That was me. <laughs> uh, that's the way, yeah. a lot, that's the way they're taught. So they're afraid to leave. Mm -hmm. And yet that, the opposite is true. You Absolutely. actually begin to bloom and you actually begin oh, to... Oh, I've never been so happy have, uh, in my whole life. Have a life, get a mm -hmm. life. So that's what we're mm -hmm. here. Um, we're, we're getting close to, uh, to the end of the show, but I want to ask you a question. There were some abusive men on the priesthood council of the polygamy group you're from, the AUB. And it made you wonder how these uh, men could, uh, it made you wonder about the, the authentic authenticity of it being God's group because these men were so abusive and yet they had been voted on, upheld and sustained by, um, by other people on the council. How would, God, how would God put abusers like that in some kind of a leadership position? Right. That was one of the catalysts for me leaving. There were many, but that was one of the biggest right there. And, and I may have even used that one as an excuse because I was already out so much. And that was just like the final straw in yeah. a sense. I, we found out that 
in public that this had been going on. I had felt it had been for years and years and years, and my soul was directing me in that direction. And it was very good for me, in a sense, to say, it's okay for me to leave. This is all. I mean, what what is truth if this has happened? They're supposed to be called by God, yeah. and they've allowed this to go on all these years and without knowing. God Why know wouldn't God? That they were abusers, right? Wouldn't they? Wouldn't my uncle Roland and fa and my father as prophets been told that these men wouldn't they have been given that if they had been prophets of if God? If they had been true prophets of I, God, that was a huge. And that's a yes, good question. Yeah. A very good question. Yes. You know, Kristen, we need to. Uh, the time is is running out on us, and so we we need to uh, wind down. Uh, if you've got um, ten seconds to say something to polygamous women who maybe are just on the verge of leaving. <laughs> Very quick comment to him. Well, I hope so much that you will find out what true joy really is and open your hearts and listen to your soul and to those voices and to the jealousy and to all the God-given feelings that were there for a reason. Yes. And realize that you can leave. And, oh, my word, it's heaven out here. That's <laughs> nice. It Thank you, heaven. Kristen, for coming. Thank I you. appreciate your being here so very Thank much. You, you know, so we've much. heard Kristen's story tonight, and we've discovered, like so many others, she was threatened with eternal damnation if she refused to make polygamy her light in her life. She had to face the same frustrations and fear and guilt that we all fear growing up, and she faced almost every day um, in the polygamy group and, and, and feeling unworthy for failures when she absolutely had no control over the circumstances and the uh, many unanswered questions that about God's character because we were all taught that living plural marriage would bring us to God. But you know what? It won't. Not one single polygamy group is able to bring us to God. In fact, the opposite is true. They've turned everything upside down. God's love has been twisted into the monster called polygamy. And that just that that is not uh, showing what God's love is. One woman for one man has always been God's mode for marriage. And, and, and it's only Jesus who brings us to God. Polygamy doesn't do that. Polygamy groups don't do that. Only Jesus is able and capable to do it. And grace alone, by faith alone, through Jesus Christ alone, has always been and will always be God's only way to get to heaven. You know, it was Jesus who purchased our rite of passage to eternal life trying to get there any other way, and that includes the way of polygamy. It only guarantees the wrong path and the wrong destination. We encourage all polygamists, as Kristen mentioned already, come out here. There's joy out here. Run from polygamy. Run into the arms of Jesus. There is a better way, God's way, and only there is where you'll find His true love and His eternal love. Thanks for watching. Good night. Wow, very good. <laughs>